might sound like an odd statement, but the relationship between the news and what I like to think of as real people has shifted somewhat throughout the years. Over to the newsroom. Not so long ago, the news basically consisted of a bloke at a desk telling you, the viewer, what had happened that day with the help of some reporters, some cheap graphics and an irritating weatherman. Real people, i.e. us common or garden shoe-wearing schlubs, didn't get much of a look in, except, of course, if we'd witnessed something important. She told me what happened after the first explosion. And the second bomb didn't go off for a good ten minutes after that. But in the late 70s and early 80s, this began to change and real people started to have more input. Uh, don't you think we should be worried that the Chinese might flood our markets with even cheaper goods than the Japanese can and so destroy any surviving industry? Of yeah, whatever, you bloody six-year-old. The concept of the public having their say hit a peak in 1983 when housewife Diane Gould famously put the boot into Mrs Thatcher live on Nationwide's On The Spot segment. Uh, Mrs Thatcher, why, when the uh, Belgrano, the Argentinian battleship, was outside the exclusion zone and actually sailing away from the Falklands, uh, why did you give the orders to sink it? But it was not sailing away from the Falklands. It was in an area which was a danger to our ships. Mrs Thatcher, I am saying that nobody with any imagination can put it sailing other than away from the Falklands. Mrs. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. It's Mrs. Comeuppance. It was in an area which was a danger yes, to in... our ships. Well, now, you accept mm. that, do you? Uh, no. It was proof that real people's questioning of the facts could move the story forward for the journalists. So from this point on, their opinions were solicited more frequently, whether they were interesting or not. Hey, real people, what do you make of the pound coin? I think a pound note uh, has got more value than a pound coin. Hey, real people, what do you think about public transport? I prefer the railway log, but I don't know how they've come with torch this time. Looking back at old Vox Pops, it's striking how unemotional and objective they can seem, perhaps because the public thought that's what the news expected of them. What happened to those around you? Um, mutilated. All of them? Or many of them? Um, well, I, I vouch for five or six. Were many I saw of them in my eyes. What, what was the scene? Well, bodies and torsos everywhere. Were um, many of them your friends? They're all my friends. I've been working with them for ten years. That situation changed with the death of Princess Diana in 1997. Here, the public's emotional reaction became the central focus of the story itself. It started out as shock and sorrow. The outpouring of emotion just grows by the day. What had begun as a sea of flowers has now turned into an ocean. Before mutating into anger... The Queen's not in residence today, but where the hell is the flag? Eh? You see what I'm saying about the establishment? And it eventually altered the events themselves. This afternoon provided the focal point the crowds had been demanding. Their sudden appearance on the Mall, just one of a series of fast-moving changes in which Buckingham Palace repeatedly bowed to the wishes of the people. Well, I'm glad she's listened to, obviously, to the media, isn't she, and to the people. Afterwards, the news was terribly pleased with itself for reflecting the feeling of the nation for being so wonderfully inclusive, which is odd because the entire saga left me, and I suspect millions of other people like me, feeling weirdly alienated. Because I wasn't an anguished mourner. Diana's death didn't make me happy, but it didn't move me to come down to the palace and demand to see the Queen weeping on the pavement either. Inadvertently, what the news was doing was driving a wedge between regular people and emotional, demonstrative and some might say overreactive people. And ever since Di's death, it's been this second group that's had more influence over the news agenda. That's why stories such as this angry ITN news piece on the Baby P report often lead on the emotional public outcry. Baby P's grave is still surrounded by the thought and care he never had in life. No one was there to help you read this card. The most recent example, of course, is the coverage of Jade Goody's death, the emotive nature of which has alienated many. We'll be looking at that later. In effect, the journalist and the public have swapped places. Instead of offering us a factual summary of events that we can then form an emotional opinion on, they're asking us for our emotional opinion and then incorporating it into their factual summary of events. That's one of the reasons we're asked our opinions more than ever via any one of the 10 million boneheaded say-what-you-think viewer feedback systems, which often just cough up a load of boneheaded gunk. Diane Aykroyd emailed to say the reason my children never eat school meals is because they are for the most part, vile slop. Oh dear. God, you know, instead of asking for emails, they might as well say, we're turning on the idiot magnet now. Well, now it's time for some of your views. We're going to switch on the idiot magnet, and our first message comes from Tony in Bristol, who says, Badoo-doo! Be-oh! Badoo-be-doo! Boo-boo-boo! 
bloody immigrants. Anyway, opinions and emotions are one thing, pictures are another. Now, anyone with an atom of sense in their head understands implicitly that in the real three-dimensional world, nobody wants to see your holiday snaps and home videos. Why? Because they're boring and your kids are boring and your holiday was boring and you're f***ing boring. But sometimes they're not boring. Thanks to modern technology, anyone might capture an exciting moment of history at any time. Footage the news will gleefully use to become more dynamic, visceral and frightening than ever. The 2004 tsunami was a decisive moment for user content. Most of these terrifying clips had been gathered by traditional news agencies, which in turn sold them onto TV networks who ran them again and again and again. Get in, get in, get in. It was so exciting that the BBC set up a dedicated user-generated content department aimed at harvesting footage directly from the viewers. Shortly afterwards, 7-7 happened and harrowing pictures sent in by those caught up in the attacks quickly made it directly onto the screen. People shot hours of footage. Now, of course, I can completely understand why you'd want to look through a viewfinder if you found yourself caught up in the middle of something like this. Seeing it all through a lens would somehow disconnect you from the misery of what was happening and make it seem less real. At least that's why I do it whenever I get caught up in a bloody argument in a bloody relationship. A few months after 7-7, another citizen journalism spectacular occurred as the Buntsfield oil depot went up like a, well, like an exploding oil depot. Minutes after the first explosions, two young men took a video camera to within 50 metres of the fires. They defied official advice to keep away. Yes, helpfully illustrating one of the potential pitfalls of citizen journalism, two amateur filmmakers raced towards the inferno with their lenses on. Aside from recklessly dumb visual observation, we also got to enjoy recklessly dumb vocal observation as one of them said it wasn't a fire but actually Satan coming to earth in the form of oil. It is actually Satan coming to earth in the form of oil. See? Imagine we were sitting right here when it went and it did that to those buildings. Yeah, I imagine we'd be dead. Yeah, well good job there aren't any oil tanks left to explode, yeah? At one point their camera zooms in on an oil tank yet to explode. Well this should be good, I hope they stick around. We've got to make a move now because they're expecting another explosion. If there is another explosion, we're going to die. Oh, come back. I was enjoying that, you chicken. Their pictures are another example of the growing public involvement in the recording of major news events. They knew it was dangerous, but say their filming instincts took over from personal fear. Still, at least the Bunsfield footage was spectacular because it was a massive explosion and not, say, a bit of snow. Now, about 20 years ago, the news used to cover heavy snowfall like this. Moira Stewart, dressed in a straitjacket, barking a load of basic information about which trains weren't running. And services to Sheffield and Newcastle are also disrupted. And a few sternly voiced VT reports telling you what to do. Emergency services have repeated their advice for people to stay inside wrap up warm and not to venture out unless it's absolutely necessary. Fast forward to earlier this year and a cold snap has suddenly become a chance to turn the news into a cuddly waddly multimedia slideshow. Been getting hundreds of uh, pictures, your pictures of the snow in different parts of the country. Let's take a look at some of them. Oh yes, look, they got a photo of some snow and a photo of some more snow and a photo with some snow in it. Oh, and a photo showing what happens when it snows. And no matter how many they got, it seemed they still didn't have enough. We would like your snow pictures, by the way, just to let you know where you can email them as we're, we're watching this. Uh, your pics at bbc.co.uk. Eventually, the sheer amount of user-generated content they'd received became a self-congratulatory story in itself. Now, over the past 24 hours, we've had the biggest response so far uh, here at the BBC to any story that we've covered. It's the weather. 35,000 pictures the BBC yesterday received of the weather. An absolutely amazing response, our biggest ever response. Well, who'd have thought a national weather condition would have generated that many pictures? Just to pop that into context for you, in total, in the Buntsfield oil, oil fire depot, we received 15,000. So yesterday, 35,000 in one day, we just couldn't believe it. How do you wade through all those pictures like that? Yeah, how and why? I think these pictures we're just looking at now, I mean, they're beautiful. Shop. Still, it was fun to hear Bill Turnbull getting a bit Alan Partridge about some of the more jackassy clips. Look at that, look at that. And, uh, that is dangerous. That really I would not recommend at all. It's probably illegal and it's not something to do. 
don't know, maybe I'm mean-spirited, but when I see all these zany f***ing photos sent in by zany f***ing members of the public, I just want to run out into the street and start kicking people in the neck. F*** your snowman pictures. Don't send them into the news. You know why? Because they're not news. They're f***ing snowman pictures. If the snowman's learned to talk or he's hanging Saddam Hussein, that's news. This is what news looks like, and this is what a snowman looks like. Can you see the difference? You know what? Paxman agrees with me. In the meantime, it's all available again on the website, along with our editor's pathetic pleas for you to send some of us your old bits of home movie and the like, so we can become the BBC's version of Animals Do the Funniest Things. Good night. Now